and uh, we're glad that you came out today. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, <clears throat> turn to Philippians chapter 4. Starting with verse 6 again. Now let's go to let's go to verse 4. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for tonight. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you always, always are taking care of us, loving us, correcting us, guiding us, and all that you have for our lives. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, shh. <laughs> She's so good. All right. Um, once again, welcome those who are watching by Facebook today. We're going to start with verse 4 because I think it's so important that in order to have, uh, in order to not have anxious, being anxious for anything, um, we need to have this first. And in, in verse 4, it says, always be full of joy. Are you always full with joy? Well, there's a reason why we're not filled with joy all the time. And that's because our minds get preoccupied with other things. And when we get preoccupied with other things, the enemy has a, has a, a field day with us sometimes. And he'll, he'll come and he'll say things to us. And we begin to listen to him, and, and you know, and we get to get our feelings hurt, and we get our feelings and emotions, uh, you know, start to run wild, and then before you know it, you know, we're we're down in the dumps, we're down in the we're down in the ditches. But God's word says, always be full of joy in the Lord. How can we always be full of joy? Joy is an emotion. Amen. How can we always be full of joy? I need someone to give me some water, please. You guys are slipping. Mrs. Ramirez. Got a nice ring to it. How can we always be full of joy? How can we always be full of joy? Come on now, you guys have been Christians for a long time. You should know this. Huh? Well, yeah, rejoice in the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's a no, that's, yeah. Right. It's not a joy you create on your own. Jesus said, the joy that I give you shall be in you. And I don't give joy as the world gives it, you know. The world gives it and takes it away. But he says, my joy shall remain in you. Jesus said that. He said, my joy shall be in you. Amen. So when you tap into God's joy that he has deposited in you. See, there's so much in us, but there's so much we don't tap into. God has deposited in us so much of, with his Holy Spirit living in us. What's one of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit? Joy, right? Joy, lo love, peace, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, gentleness, all those things. They're in us, but th we have to allow them to come forward and come out. But that comes through breaking. That comes through allowing God to bring those things. And sometimes it's hard because the things that we go through, they speak louder than what God does. And so what happens is we start to listen to those things. And we've been in a pattern over our lives for years. Okay? But he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So he's making a double emphasis on that. Because you know what? 
when things go wrong and things start to, start to go haywire in our life, instead of concentrating on that, just begin to think about what God has done for you. And just think about how God has, has brought you out of the, out of the, the pits of hell. You're, you're on your way to destruction, and God came in and stepped in between you and, and hell and the devil and saved your soul. That's a time of rejoicing right there. Amen. Okay, next verse, please. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Okay? That you are considerate in all you do. Let everyone see that. Now, that doesn't mean if I give somebody $20 that I go, hey, see this? No, it doesn't mean that. But just be considerate in all that you do. In other words, when you see somebody suffering, you know, be considerate. When you see somebody in the need, be considerate in all that you do. He says, for remember, the Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming soon. And that's the emphasis. Even Paul back then, 2,000 years ago, was telling people, the Lord is coming soon. There was an eminence of his return. They expected it. Even though it didn't happen, but they were expecting it to happen. Okay? They didn't know it wasn't going to happen. Okay? We see from hindsight. Well, he didn't come. But they didn't think so. They were saying, he's coming soon. Okay? How much more in the last days, as we see the prophetic calendar being fulfilled, is the Lord coming soon? Amen. He is. Next verse, please. Don't worry about anything. We talked on this last week. But look at this one in the, I think it's NIV. Can we look at that in the NIV? Do not be anxious about anything. You know, there, so many people today are suffering from anxiety. They're, they're going to doctors, they're going to counseling, nothing wrong with that. But as a Christian, the first and foremost thing you want to do is go to God. And seek him first. And, and if you don't see results from that, then go to the doctor. You know, but put God first. Give him a shot. Give him a chance to prove who he is. Amen? Um, I, I posted something on Facebook from B.H. Clendenin on, uh, about unbelief. Watch that. It's very powerful. Watch that. It's, it's excellent. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious. Don't get all, all messed up in your emotions and your feelings because in your emotions and feelings, you're going to make wrong decisions. Never make important decisions when you're emotionally distraught because you'll make the wrong decision nine out of ten times. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, say everything, 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 by prayer, and petition, prayer, praying. What's praying? Okay, what else is prayer? Huh? Dialogue? Yeah. What else is prayer? It's talking to God, but it's God talking to you. See, uh, uh, there's a ding-dong on, on the view there. I forget what her name is. But she said, if God talks to you, you need psychological help. Joy, whatever her name is. She ain't no joy, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, she's the joy of this world, is right. Okay? But think about it. She said, if God talks to you, you, you have some kind of psychosis going on. You need to have your head examined. Isn't that sad? That some people believe that God doesn't speak to people today? Now, I know we got all the nuts out there that says God told me to go kill somebody. That's, that's definitely, yeah, that's the God of this world, the devil, but it's not the God of our Heavenly Father. 
but you know, people are so skittish to, to just sit and listen and let God speak to their hearts. But that's what prayer is. It's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It's not always us going up to God and giving him all of our things, and then we say, okay, and we walk away. No, because in those things, God wants us to talk, talk to us. So he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, by dialogue with God. By sitting alone with God and, 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 and that, that thing that's coming on you to make you anxious, you say, God, this thing is, is coming at me, boy, and I, I don't know what to do, uh, but I'm not going to be anxious in it. Okay? But I'm asking you for your grace. I'm asking you for your mercy. I'm asking you for your power to resist this anxiousness. And, and I just need a word from you, God. Give me, give me a word from you to, for today. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will come and bring a scripture to your remembrance. And you go to that scripture and you go, wow, man, that, that thing fits so, so right on. And that's what God does. So by alleviating that anxiousness, you can, you can alleviate that not so much through medication. And medication, you can do it, and it's good. But you can alleviate a lot of anxiety by prayer. Because you, the Bible says, cast all your care upon him. So by casting all your care upon him, because he cares for you, okay, that helps to alleviate the pressure. He says, by prayer and your petition. And also, prayer includes worship, adoration, amen, giving God you know, uh, uh, adoration and, and love and just saying, God, you know, you're my father and I love you. And you're, you're the best father uh, a, a person could ever have. You're greater than my earthly father ever was. You care more about me than my earthly father ever did. And, and God, you're so great and you're so majestic and you're so powerful. There's nothing too hard for you. And you begin to speak the very attributes of God back to God. You know what that, that does for your problem? You know, I read this one time. It says, don't look at how, 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 how small your problem is. Look at how big God is. Because in the light of who God is, your problem is just a little tiny thing. Right? Because God can do anything. He can do anything. Okay? God can walk somebody through that door right now and give me a check for $3 million to build that church over there. He can do it. If he wants to do it, he can do it. Okay? We just have to trust him. He said, with thanksgiving. God, I don't know why I'm going through this. Lord, this is a heavy one. <clears throat> okay? Don't know where we're going to get any food from. Run out of food, God. I know none of you ever ran out of food, right? You get to that point where you run out of food and you don't have anything, and you've got to trust God. You just, you just pray. I, I say just, but you pray. I'll never forget this, Casey, uh, and this is really cool. Okay, we had a, a friend of ours, uh, Bob Lewis and I had a friend, Jim Whitson, and he had a son. His son was about 12 years old, I believe, at the time, somewhere around there. And uh, he wanted these real expensive sneakers. And um, Jim just didn't have the money to, to buy those kind of sneakers. And you, you're talking 20 years ago? at least, maybe more. And uh, so his father told him, he said, Ricky, pray. Ask God. Okay. So Ricky prayed, and he asked God. He said, I want these sneakers. I like to have them in this color. And, I, and my father said for me to prove you and to pray. So I'm praying, God, that you will give me these sneakers in my size. I guess it was about a week and a half later. This kid comes into school, okay, and goes up to Ricky and says, Ricky, he says, um, I got these sneakers. I bought them, kept them in my room, in, my, in the box, never wore them. He said, but from the time I kept them there, for maybe three months or whatever, my, my foot grew, and it's a little tight on my, my foot. I was wondering if you'd like to have them. He said, well, let me see them. And he opened the box, and can you guess what was in it? It was the sneaker he wanted, the color he wanted, in his size. See, we don't, we don't understand the 
greatness and the vastness of who God is. With thanksgiving, present your request to Him. With thanksgiving. Amen? Next verse. And it says, and the peace of God, if you do this first part of this, what was the very first part you have to do? Rejoice. Have that joy always as your motivating factor. Always have that joy, that inner joy, that peace that goes beyond understanding. I don't understand how you can have peace. Even, even when my mother passed away, my father passed away, and my brother passed away, at all three of the funerals I had peace. It was inner peace. I remember one of the pastors come up to me at my mother's funeral and saying, Bob, I don't know, but you just have this glow about you that of God's grace all over you. And that's what you need in time of need is God's grace, his ability to pull you through things and to bring you to places that normally emotionally you'd fall apart when things happen. But he says, and the peace of God, what is that? I mean, we have peace, but what? Pe how do we get that peace? By trust? Okay. But how, do, how did we get it? The peace of God I'm talking about. Jesus said it. He said, my peace, my peace, he said, I give unto you. You think Jesus had peace? He said, my peace I give unto you. Amen. And so we have that. Jesus said, I've given it to you. It's in you. Like I said, there's a reservoir in us that we don't tap into that God has given us these, these abilities to lean on him and not on our own understanding, right? The Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace as, say the word as, your mind is stayed on him, not on the situation, not on the problem. But as you put your mind, I'm not telling you to ignore them. You're going to have situations. You're going to have circumstances. You don't ignore them and just toss them and like toss them aside, not, not deal with them. No. But in the midst of that, you keep your mind in perfect peace as your mind is stayed upon him. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Man, I don't understand it. You know, this happened to you, and this happened to you, and that happened to you, and, and, and this happened to you in your life. And yet, it doesn't seem to bother you. How come? How come it's not bothering you? Well, it's not according to my understanding. It transcends God's peace. It transcends all understanding. And what will it do? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It guards it from what? Hurt. Disappointment. What else? Discouragement. Disappointment. Anxiety. Okay. Next verse. Okay. Now here is, if I could say it this way, this is the prescription. Okay. Because how many of us have thoughts that run through our head every single day? I mean, just all kinds of thoughts. All kinds of worldly thoughts, okay, un un sometimes sinful thoughts. The enemy will put thoughts in your mind, you know, okay. Um, it happens, right? It can happen to any of us. Um, we see something on TV and something that may, you know, we have to change the channel real quick, and when that thought comes into mind and the devil says, hey, you know, <laughs> uh, you know. How do we... How do we combat that? Well, God's given us a prescription for that. Dr. God. Okay. The great physician. This is what he says. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. So the first thing we need to do is we need to discover what's the truth. 
When you go in and you've got all this anxiety coming at you and all kinds of problems and situations coming at you, first thing the devil's going to do is blame you. Okay? He's going to come at you with all kinds of thoughts and how to fix it and do it in your own strength and everything else. Okay? But it says the first thing, brothers, finally, whatever is true. So you have to dissect that. Now, I've seen, I'll give you an example. I've seen on television sometimes people go to a seminar, they go to a church service, and um, they're talking about finances. And he said, I want all you people that have financial problems, come on up here. And they run up here and say, you want God to deliver you from your financial problems? Yes, I want God to deliver me from my financial problems. Okay, throw all your credit cards on the altar. And they come out and they throw all their credit cards on the altar, you know, and and they're walking away, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Yeah, 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 I'm free. It's not the way it's done. Okay. God is not going to heal you or deliver you from your debt until he delivers you from your covetousness. Because that's the bottom issue. When you're spending money that you don't have, and you're putting it on the credit cards and putting it on the credit cards as you're living beyond your means, guess what? You're covetous. Hello? And so you rack up all these big bills, and now you're worried about these bills and all the anxiousness about those bills, but you've got to first sit down and say, whatever is true. And that's why, as a Christian, in your Christian integrity and character, if you've got bills that you've, you've, you've accumulated and then you are a Christian now, that doesn't mean you just wipe them off and, and not pay them. What you do is you set up a plan and you set up a, a goal that this is how, what I want to do to get out of debt, and you set that goal and you do it. Amen? Okay, whatever's true, whatever that anxiety comes. Now, the devil will come and lie to you and tell you, you're bipolar. I always thought someone bipolar was a person that lived in the middle of the United States. <laughs> but think about it. The devil will come and tell you you got all kinds of psychological things. No. Whatever is true. God said he has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and what else? A sound mind. A sound mind. One that is able to think and process the situation and the problems because you have gone, as the Bible says, to God. God says he will keep your mind in perfect peace as your mind is stayed on him. Because now you're seeking not to live your life independent from God, but you're looking to surrender your life in dependence to God. And he's going to lead and guide you into all truth. Amen. So whatsoever is true, whatever is noble, with dignity, whatever is right, Whatever's pure, and that's a hard one sometimes. Because we have impure thoughts. We're going to talk about how to battle those thoughts. What does God expect from us on those issues? Whatever is lovely. Whatever is admirable. God wants you to think on pure thoughts. He wants you to think about whatever is lovely, whatever is ad admirable. If anything is excellent of praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about those things. Keep them in the forefront of your mind. Think pure things. Think whatever is right, things that are noble, whatever is true, whatever is praiseworthy and admirable. Think on those things. Next verse. 
And then he says this, whatever you have learned, whatever you have learned, how do you learn? How do you learn? By experience? One of the, one of the only, I'll say it this way. I think the most important thing in learning is listening. <clears throat> but not only listening, but applying. <coughs> Excuse me. So a person can listen to you. I can go to Joe and say, okay, Joe, you have experience, knowledge in the financial industry. I can go to Joe and say, Joe, this is my situation. <clears throat> I need advice on financial things. Okay. He tells me A, B, C, D. I walk away doing E, F, G, H, O. Did I listen? I heard him. There's a difference between hearing and a difference between listening. When you listen, you take, the, you take it and you do it. It's the same way with God. When you hear God from his word and, and you read God's word, and you're hearing God's word, the way that we can tell or God can tell or anyone can tell if you're really listening to God's word is if you're doing it. If you're not doing it, then you're only hearing it. You know, you're like the hearers. You know, the seed falls on the ground, they hear, but the, the enemy comes and steals the seed away. And there's no growth. Because you're, you're not listening, you're hearing, but you're not listening. He says, what you have learned or received or heard from me. Wait a minute. <clears throat> what's, what's the Apostle Paul saying there? What you receive from me? Yeah. God will use people. God will use pastors and apostles and prophets, evangelists, to speak into your life. That's why when we have guest speakers come into the it's not just to give me a break. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that I bring these people into the assembly to be a blessing to you, to give an impartation to you of their giftings and what they have so that you can grow and, you know, and mature. He says, what you heard from me, seen in me, put it into practice. So if I'm telling you to do something and I'm not doing it, then... You're not going to do it because you're going to say, why should I do that? Okay. How many of us growing up when we were, before we were even Christians and, we, and our parents made us go to church, right? To the point when we got older and we said, mom and dad, you don't go. Why should I go? Doesn't make any sense. You're forcing me to go as a kid, but you don't go. He says, what you've seen in me. The example is set before you. What you've seen in me, do it. You know, I have a I have a debate sometime with somebody, one of my friends. And he he said, uh, well, you know, if I see somebody in need, he said, I got to pray about it <clears throat> before I do anything. I said, well, that's a super spiritual answer. So my Bible tells me if you see a brother or sister in a need and it's in your power to meet the need, just do it. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't need to seek God and sound spiritual. Hello? Just do it. You see a brother or sister that's down on, on the uh, Jericho Road <laughs> in need, hungry, and you're walking by with a Subway sandwich, Come on. And you walk by and go, hey, man, ran into some tough luck, huh? I'll be praying for you. What good does that do? Give them half of your subway. 
do something. Amen? Praise God. Look at, um, i got to find the scripture now. I think it's 2 Corinthians. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How to walk in God's peace. Now, let me say this. I fight this battle. I've practiced this, and there's times that I've failed this. <clears throat> but for the majority of the times, I do do this. What I'm sharing with you, okay? Uh, chapter 10. Verse 3. Can you put that in NLT for me, please? We are human. Is anyone here not human? <clears throat> okay, we're human, right? He said, we, and he includes himself. The Apostle Paul includes himself, and he says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. What's he saying? We don't fight like they do. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to take out a, a literal sword or a gun and, and fight against the things that come against us. I'm not talking about protecting yourself. That's, I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm saying in the spiritual realm, because we're talking about in the spirit. Okay? Next verse. We use God's mighty weapons. Do you know that God has weapons? Do you know when the enemy comes at you and he comes in like a flood? God raises a standard against that flood. Do you know that you can ask God to, to send his angels to protect you? Every day, every day, my wife and I, we pray in the morning before she goes to work. God, send your holy angels to surround Linda as she travels to work and back home. And we pray this other part to it too. And we bind all aggressive drivers against her. Amen. And I can testify to you, when Linda used to work in Pawtucket, which was what, about a 40-minute drive, about a 40-minute drive, every day we pray for, for protection. We pray for mechanical problems, everything. You know she never got a flat tire, never broke down on the side of the road. It's not a coincidence, guys. He works. He works. You, we use God's mighty weapons. What are some of God's weapons? Huh? Sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. What's the other weapons to help us deal with the things that come against us? The blood of Jesus. What else? His angels. What else? Huh? The Bible? Yep. Absolutely. What else? Holy Spirit? Yep. What else? Faith? Yes, what else? Truth, what else? Prayer, what else? I mean, come on, we've got a lot of weapons so far. We've got an arsenal. The what? Oh, zeal. I thought he said Brazil. I was saying, okay, what's, what's in Brazil? What else? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a result of, though, okay. 
Righteousness? Okay, what, what, what's, the, what's the other weapons? Okay, that's another result, but that's good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, other questions to, to help in prayer? Yes. Authority in what? In my name. The authority that God has given over to us, he says he has delegated to us authority in his name. What can we do in his name? Heal the sick? Cleanse the lepers? Raise the dead? Amen. That doesn't mean you go to a funeral home and start raising the dead if God didn't tell you to do that. That's a special miracle. and You've got to have a special miracle of faith for that thing. And if God tells you to do it, do it, and that person will raise from the dead, like what Brother Diamond did. And he went to Africa, and this woman in the village, he, she was very, very sick, and they wanted him to go pray for her. And by the time he got to the, to the village that she was in and got to her hut, she had died. And uh, he went in, and through the interpreters and everything, they said, man of God, please. We're sorry, that, but she's already passed. She's already gone. And uh, God gave him a word. And he said, before the sun come, rises up on the banana trees, she shall live. He turned around and walked on. It wasn't in Jesus' name. It wasn't, no, no, no. no. We don't, it wasn't formulas. God doesn't use formulas. But he knows those who use his authority that he's given. So he just said that. Before the sun rises on the banana tree, she shall live. He walked out. So by that time, the people came to gather the body so they could bury it. And there was a little old woman there. And she said, please don't take the body. Man of God said, before sun come up on banana tree, she shall live. Let's leave her for the night. So she convinced them. She left. And just as that sun came up over the horizon, over the mountain, and that sunlight hit that banana tree, that woman sat up. Come on now. And she lived. He'll tell you the story. When he's here, when, you, when we have fellowship with him and stuff, ask him that story. Say, tell me that story about that, that woman that came, that rose from the dead. Mighty weapons. You have, like I was saying, residual inside of us because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ lives in you. You have the right to exercise that authority over demons. How many believe that? You really believe that? Okay, next time a demon manifests, don't you dare run. You have authority. Now, let me give you an example of authority. A policeman pulls you, pulls you over. He's not, he's not going to say, get out of the car. Get out of the car. Please get out of the car. Get out of the car! You might use a few explore, you know, Expelatives. Get out of the car. You've got to take the authority. Hello? I remember one time, Linda, we had a, I think it was a woman's fellowship, and it was a, a, somebody that came, and she had a demon. 
They started praying for her, and she ran into the kitchen. And, she, and, at, and at the time, we had a tile in the kitchen. And she fell. She slipped on the tile. She fell down. And they prayed for her. And she got a partial deliverance from that, I believe. And they, you know, devil, get out of here in Jesus' name. In the middle of the night, Linda woke up, and she heard our side door open and close. And, she, and the next day she said to me, you know what? She said, that demon was lingering in our house. She said, but last night it left. I heard it leave. Okay, now, most people would say, okay, send her to the psychiatrist. She's lost her mind. But it's true. Joe could tell you, I think he told you a story one time about his bed bouncing up and down. Oh, it's real. But what he did was he ran out because <laughs> he didn't know Jesus, didn't know the authority that he had. Okay. But you and I have that authority to stand up and say, devil, you're not going to convince me. You're not going to lie to me anymore. I'm going to do what God's word says. You've been robbing me for, for, for a long time. I'm going to believe God rather than believe what man says. I'm going to believe God's word rather than the false preachers and the false shepherds and the, and the false prophets on TV say. I'm going to believe your word, God. I'm going to believe your word over my feelings. Because you're not always going to feel right. You're not always going to feel like doing certain things. You know, the devil's going to tell you all kind of lies. Well, you know, you really can't do this and you really can't do that. I can tell you one thing. When you listen to God, God will bless you. He'll bless you going in, you're coming out, you're lying down, you're rising up. If you're obedient, the Bible says, if, and well, he says there's two things. He says, if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. He says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Amen. Sometimes the devil will come and, you know, we're, as men, the devil will tempt us. Oh, look at that woman. Isn't she pretty? And then it goes from, isn't she pretty, to something else. You have to take authority over that. I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. You ain't going to put that thought in my mind. I take authority over you. I bind your spirit of whatever it is. Get out of my mind in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus on my mind. Jesus said, you're in a war. 24-7. You're in a war. That devil wants your soul. And whatever weakness and whatever area of your life that is not given over to God, he's going to use that against you to try to pull you even further away from God. And that's why we've got to fight. We've got to use these weapons that God has given us. My Bible says in verse 5, can we go to, uh, uh, go to verse 4 in the King James? I, I want to just give you that for a moment. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, if you're praying for somebody that's bound, you can pray in this manner. Lord Jesus, I pray and I bind the powers of darkness in that person's life. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will loose her right now or him right now. I pray the blood of Jesus Christ upon them right now. God, I pray that you will open their eyes. God, send and do whatever you need to do to get that person right with you. I remember a pastor up at uh, Zion preached that way one time. I mean, prayed that one that way one time. And the people that he was praying for, 
got into a very bad, bad car accident. But God used that car accident to get them back to him. So though they had to go through some discomfort, they had to go through a little bad time, guess what? The end result was they rededicated their life to Christ. Mighty through God to the pulling down, pulling down the strongholds. These strongholds, there is a stronghold over New Bedford. It's strong. Been there for centuries. There's such division. It's not just economic. But think about it. New Bedford, in the history of New Bedford, there was a time when we had the colonies. And New Bedford used to have on their payroll missionaries that would go out to all the villages and to the Indians and preach the gospel. And they were paid. Did you know that? And today, if you stand on the corner, they'll arrest you. So look how far away we've come. And these are strongholds that need to be pulled down through prayer and fasting. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations. Boy, we can imagine a lot of junk. But you need to cast it down. Cast it down. Don't let it, don't let it fester in your mind. You got, you're facing a situation, and you've got one more day left, and if you don't do something, something's going to happen. And that thing just bothers you and bothers you and bothers you. and bo You need to take authority over that thing. Cast down that imagination. Oh, God's not going to come through for you at this time. No, you really blew it. God's not going to come through for you. If you're faithful to God, God will be faithful to you. Are you hearing me? If you're faithful in the little things, You'll be faithful in the bigger things. You cannot, you know, there's a scripture that says, I saw princesses walking and beggars riding horses. There's a scripture like that. It's twisted. Mighty through God to the pulling down of imagination. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I hear, you don't know, I hear Christians all the time say, not every Christian, but a lot of Christians say this, God don't love me. If God loved me, this would not happen to me. And I ask them this question, what does the attribute of God and his love have anything to do with your wrong decision making? You made the mess. And you wonder why God doesn't love me. No, God loves you. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? I want you to prove to me that God loves me. For God so loved the, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son. That's the ultimate love right there. So every person within the sound of my voice, you have scriptural proof of God's love. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for your sin, for my sin. That settles it. The issue of God's love. Casting down imaginations. How do you do that? I bring that thought down and that imagination down in the name of Jesus. I bind you in my mind in the name of Jesus. 
You're not going to tell me God is unfaithful? The Word of God says that He is faithful. In fact, when He comes back on His thigh, is written faithful and true. You can't fight the battles if you don't know this Word. This Word has to be in you. Your car will not go anywhere unless you put gas in it. The food in your refrigerator won't get eaten unless you go and take it and make something. You can't fight the spiritual battle if... You haven't got this word inside of you. If you won't memorize it, if you won't meditate on it, it's more than just reading one verse of Scripture. It's getting that to be a part of you, in you. Because when the battle comes raging, you ain't going to have time to go looking. <clears throat> okay? Because he comes at some of the... Un he comes at the, the times that are not convenient. How many battles we fought in our sleep? I don't know. You ever get attacked in your sleep? I got attacked the other night by a demon. And it had a hold on me like this. And I struggled a little bit. And, and then I said, in the name of Jesus. And it got loose. I said, in the name of Jesus. And it got loose. And eventually backed off. In my sleep. And I can always tell when my wife's in trouble. See, because God's called us to be their protector. I'll be sleeping. And this is the truth, what I'm telling you. Okay, I'll be sleeping. All of a sudden, I'll hear this. <laughs> Sounds like Curly on the Three Stooges. And I'll wake up. And I can tell. <laughs> I guess she's tr crying out, you know? And I'll just put my hand on it and I say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the devil and all those attacks in Jesus' name. Comes right down. We're in a war, folks. That anxiety, we can be anxious about things. And God said, don't be anxious. Just turn it over to me. Okay? Yeah, but, you know, I made mistakes. That's okay. God can fix them. May cost you a little bit. Casting down imagine every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Ah, Joe, God ain't gonna get you through this thing. You know, he he's not gonna be faithful to you. God's not faithful. What do you tell him? Or do you stop believing him? I guess I really messed up. I guess he won't be faithful. Yeah, if you're faithful, he'll be faithful. Hello? So sometimes, you know what? Read, uh, read Proverbs. When, when you and I will take the wisdom of God and throw it aside, guess what he says? When your calamity comes, I will laugh at you. Like I was saying, I go to Joe, I get my, I get my A, B, C, D, E, from, uh, A, B, C, D from him, and I go do E, F, G, H, I. That's not wisdom. You go to somebody that's been doing this for a long time and has proven it to be real. And guess what? When you go that way, you say, you know what? Pastor's been doing this for a long time, and I, I see him blessed. He must be doing something right. Hello? Bringing it into captivity every thought that is against the knowledge of God. Every high thing that's against the knowledge. 
every evil imagination that is against the knowledge of God. Bring it into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what that equals? Peace of mind. God, I don't know how you're going to get me out of this. <laughs> God, I'm worried about this thing. I'm worried about that thing. But your word says not to worry. Well, I don't know what's going to happen next Thursday when I go before the judge. Don't worry about next Thursday. You may not make it. Come on. Something may happen. I could tell you testimonies after testimonies after testimonies. This one couple going for a divorce. The husband had a girlfriend already. He decided that's it. The marriage is over. He wasn't a Christian. She was, I guess, a off and on Christian. I don't know. But he was living with his girlfriend. He's on his way to court that day for the judge to give the final. He's driving down a country road, going to Braley Road, to get on 195. And he sees a little white church. And he said, you know what? Before I go, I'm going to, so this woman don't take me, take me for a ride. I'm going to go pray. And he walked in there, and he walked into a full blast Pentecostal. The Holy Ghost grabbed a hold of that man. He ran to that altar. Got saved. Went home where he was living with his girlfriend. Said, I'm sorry. Me living with you is not right. I need to go back and try to salvage my marriage. Went to the courtroom. wife, again, was a Christian. I don't know how strong she was, but she was a Christian. Probably prayed and didn't see any results. Now they're before the judge, and here he comes in the courtroom. And she's sitting there, ready to have that judge just slam that thing down. And he says, Your Honor, can I say something? She says, Yes, you can say something. He says, I want you to know what happened to me. He said, I was on my way here. He says, I stopped to make little prayer that you would be fair to me. He said, but something happened to me. I got born again, and I want, my I want my wife to know that if she's willing right now before you, I make this pledge to make my marriage work. I want to be reconciled back to my wife. Her tears started streaming down her face, and she said, I will, I will. And can I tell you, they've been married even till today. God restore that at the midnight hour. Casting down everything to the obedience of Christ. Take authority to what God has given you. What's yours in this life. Find out your giftings. Find out your calling. What God has for you. I'm talking according to the word. What's in the word? Oh, God's called me to be a mob boss. I don't think so. God's called me to be the most successful drug dealer. I don't think so. God's called me to, God's called me to be the biggest car thief the world has ever seen. I don't think so. But all the anxiety that we experience is because we don't do our part. And if we do our part in casting down those imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, will have the victory. Amen? Let's pray. Yes. That's right. You're going away. I'm surprised you didn't ask us to go with you. We love Puerto Rico. Let's pray for them. Can we just stretch our hands toward our sister back there? Come on, stand up. 
You're going to get up anyway. Hmm. Except for Grandma. Grandma, you can just sit there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Tara and for Ray. We pray, God, that you'll bless her, Father, as they go on their trip to Puerto Rico. Give them traveling mercies, Father, from the, uh, from the <clears throat> crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Keep them all safe, the whole family, as they travel. Lord, we pray, God, that you send an angel on the nose and the tail and the two wings and let them fly there safely and back home. And while they're on the island, they'll be safe from, Lord, <clears throat> all danger. We bind all danger in the name of Jesus. We bind all <clears throat> opposition in the name of Jesus. I pray for full cooperation and favor as they're on that island. God, I pray, Lord, that you would be with them and let them have an enjoying time with, his, with Ray's family. And all that's there, Father God. Lord, let it be a blessing to them, Father. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Father, we just as we go our separate ways, be with us tonight. And we thank you for tonight, and we thank you for your word. Help us to be warriors, to be fighters. Lord, to, to, be, in the, to be in the game, not just on the sideline, watching. In Jesus' name, amen.